anybody about our prayer book? Does anybody here not know about our prayer book? If you don't know about our prayer book, come see me after service and I will tell you all about the prayer book. This is a book of names. It's not a book of prayers. It's a book of people who have put their names in here that need prayer. If you're not here in this building and you're on the internet, you can send your name to the address. Uh, it'll either be on the screen or you can find it on our website, rockandcountrychurch.com. Uh, all our information is there. If you will send your name in, we will not only put your name in this book, Pastor Woody will send you a Rock and Country Church is Praying for Me decal that you can put anywhere you want. Just put it where you can see it to constantly remind you that we are praying for you. This book is prayed over multiple times a week. I think at this point we have almost something going on every day here at the church. And every time we're here we pray over it. And most of us pray over it when we're at home also. Prayer is a powerful thing. Prayer is the answer to anything, any question you have, prayer. That'll answer any question. Um, if everybody will move your hats and come together, and we are going to uh, go to the Lord in prayer once again. Dear Lord, we thank you again for allowing us to come here to stand up for the, the names in this book. We ask that you will lay your hands upon each and every one of them. We pray that you'll fulfill whatever needs they may have. We ask that you'll be with uh, us today as we go through our service. Place your hands upon Pastor Woody. Fill him with your spirit. Allow him to deliver the message that you uh, give him to deliver, Lord. We ask that you'll be with our community. Touch the lives of the people around here locally. If they do not know you, Lord, I pray that you'll put something in each, somebody in each and every one of their lives to uh, draw them to you. I pray that you'll lay your hands upon our offerings, Lord. Allow us to use it to do your work and not ours, Lord. We just... Thank you every day for allowing us to be a part of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning, Rockin' Country Church. I apologize for moving around there, but uh, I'm trying to get a better feel of uh, what our music sounds like for y'all. Me sitting over here, I hear one thing, and uh, y'all sitting out there, you hear something else. And I'm just trying to figure out a good balance of our music. Uh, myself mike kind of disagrees with me but myself i think it needs to be cranked up <laughs> okay but uh anyway we'll we'll investigate that further if you will uh, a couple of things i want to uh say if you will and uh, before we pray it up and get on with our message today uh john 3 7 is still our, with a question mark is still our scripture for the day though we're not going to be there but that is our scripture for the day, and you will see this at the end. But uh, we need to further investigate some things, so we'll do that. First of all, though, I, I, I don't who put who put the bag of Reese's up here on the on the pulpit. Anybody gonna fess up to that? Johnny did. Thank you, brother. Hey, Sister Ferris gave me a big bag of it too. Yeah, you remember too. <laughs> hey. I love them things, man, and y'all, y'all, not just y'all, anybody's invited, I'll share with you, I'll be more than happy to share, huh, hey, thank you, thank you, thank you, I do appreciate that, uh, I did, like, I, I don't know where that came from last week, but anyway, it wasn't in my notes, I guarantee you, <laughs> yeah, but uh, my kids are going to give me a, a bunch of Reese's at Christmas, I know that, and it'll last me about a day, <laughs> because I love those things, but anyway. So thank you for the thank you for the gift. I, I do appreciate it very very much. Uh, the other thing I want to say is is all those who helped yesterday and Brother Mike's mom's memorial service. I really 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 do appreciate your help in in everything there. And so does Mike. So does the family. You guys, uh, especially you ladies, y'all just knocked it right out of the park, man. I mean, uh, we thank you very very much for all the effort, all the work you put into it, and the family was very very pleased with that. So. Uh, we are, that is being the church. You were the church yesterday on display, and you, you were uh, batting a thousand. So thank you, thank you very much for that. God bless you all. Uh, with that, uh, we have Bobby today. Is that, oh, uh, John, is that John? No, Brent, um, Bentley. I couldn't think of your name, Bubba. Sorry. Hey, you want to preach today, Bentley? You want to you wanna preach today? He would, I guarantee you. <laughs> no. <laughs> You can preach back in the back, okay? All right, let's go ahead and go. Oh, we've got somebody else back there. Who, who do we have back there, if you please? What's your name, buddy? Gage? Welcome, Gage. God bless you. Glad you're here, man. So we've got kiddos, uh, Miss Becky. You got, you got it, your work cut out for you. Three boys. <laughs> Four boys? Oh, yeah, I forgot number 11. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll, uh, we'll dismiss the kiddos. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day and each and every day, Lord, that you give us. It is, um, it's just a miracle, the fact that you just let us continue on in this life that we have. Uh, but you do it because you love us so very, very, very much. God, I ask you to open up our hearts, minds, souls, and spirits to receive your word today, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Let it resonate in our hearts, grow in our hearts, manifest in our hearts, and, and let us go out and share that with the world. Uh, everybody in here, pretty much, that I know of is uh, saved, ready to go. If it happened today, we would all, none of us would be left here. But there are people out in the world, many, many people, and your word says that you do not want any, not one, to perish. And it is up to, up to us to continue the work of Jesus Christ and to go out into the world and share the gospel of Jesus. And we thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to serve you. Thank you for being with us each and every day. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's dismiss the kiddos. And number 11. <laughs> Does everybody know what John 3 and 7 is? What does it say? And Jesus said, you must be born again. That's been our topic. That was our topic last week. And we're going to continue on with that today. But we're not going to continue in verse, or John 3, 7. Because I just want you to know what that verse says. That verse says you must be born again. In order to get to heaven, you must what? Be born again. That's what Jesus says. Jesus is not saying it might be a good idea. He's saying you must be. So we need to understand what being born again is. Now, uh, tentatively, I'm just going to let you know this. Tentatively, I may be uh, going out of country uh, this next Sunday. And so Brother Chris is going to be here for a couple of weeks. And then uh, when I get back, we're going to, uh, we're going, I'm going to teach on John 3. Uh, when Nicodemus came to Jesus that night and Jesus ended up telling him, you must be born again because we need to understand what that is. So don't teach on that, Chris. All right, while I'm gone. <coughs> if, I, if I go, if I don't go, I'm going to be here, but Chris is still going to, uh, going to teach next Sunday and the Sunday after that. Um, but I want you to know, and you need to know, what being born again is. It is not being dunked in the water. We talked about the five baptisms last week, and we're going to kind of cover that again briefly, very briefly, and then we're going to get on into scriptures, scriptures telling what we must do and, and how and why we're to be born again. Well, first and foremost, we had five baptisms that we talked about last week. One was baptism by water, which we all understand. It's the water baptism. It's the immersion. It's the sinking. It's the washing away of the exterior, symbolization of washing away the sins of, on our exterior. Uh, then we had the baptism by fire, which is the purification, purification of our spirit. The purification of his spirit doesn't mean that you're lit up. It means that God comes and lives inside of you and purifies, get this now, purifies your spirit to where your spirit is 100% sinless without sin. Now, you still have a soul and you still have a body to deal with, and those are sinful. But your spirit, according to 1 John, your spirit is made perfect as Jesus is perfect. The true you, the true spirit you, which is over in Genesis 1 and, and 26, where it tells us that we are made in his image. In the image of God, we are made. Male and female, we are made. That means our spirit being is perfectly made in the image of God. Then we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is coming in indwelling in you. And we're going to talk about that specifically today. The Holy Spirit comes and in, is indwelling in you which means he comes and lives in you. 
Then we have number four, which was baptism of the dead, and then number five, baptism of Moses. Those two we're not concerned with. Baptism of the dead is there's no way whatsoever that our baptism or our righteousness or our sanctification or our justification or anything that we do, our saving, anything that we become or do has nothing to do with anyone who has preceded us in death. The Jews thought maybe that if they were baptized in the dead, in some one person, in a person who was dead, then maybe it would affect their salvation or their relationship with God. It does not. It does not. Each and every one of us, Scripture teaches us over and over and over, each and every one of us will be held accountable for our own actions. So nothing that I can do can help any of my relatives that may or may not have been saved. Okay, so we're not concerned with that and should never be concerned with that. But we need to know it because some people say, well, Scripture says that we could be baptized for the dead. So what does that mean? I just shared it with you. Now, the last one, is the, which is the fifth one, is being baptized in Moses. The Jewish people felt as though because they were God's chosen people, they were given the law, they were given the written law by God through Moses. Moses was their prophet. Moses was their man of God. Moses was the one that they looked to to uh, intercede, if you will, between them and God. We don't look for Moses to intercede with us between us and God. We look for Jesus to intercede for us between us and God. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing to this very day. Romans 8 tells us that he is in seated, the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and me. Interceding for you and me. In other words, he's saying, no, God, don't wipe out Woody this day. I know he messed up, but he's one of mine. He's one of yours. So that's what Jesus is doing for you. He's up there. Uh, you know what cheerleaders do? Did y'all watch any of the football games yesterday? Boy, the cheerleaders for, for Georgia were just going crazy because they, they whooped up on Florida big time. And I'm not even a football fan, and that was an exciting game. But the cheerleaders, they, they, they encourage the team. It's kind of like our praise and worship music. It is to encourage you to allow the Spirit to touch you and lift you up today. Jesus does that for you. He is your number one cheerleader in heaven in front of God. He is there today saying, man, these people are mine. They are great. It doesn't matter what they've done. I've washed them clean. I paid for it, so they're good to go. Man, I love these people. Don't you just love them, Father? Yeah, but they just mess up, mess up, mess up. Yeah, but they're still ours. They're mine. And whatever you gave me, I shall not lose. So he's cheering for you. He's interceding for you. He's saying, no, they're mine. So they are saved. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for doing what he, what he wants to do, which is to show us the love of the Father, even when we mess up. Romans 5 tells us, as yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Wow. Christ was on your side even when you weren't on his side. And he still loves you today. And he is interceding for you and me every day. I would like you to know that the, like I said, the last two, we do not need to even concern ourselves with whatsoever. But the first three are very, very, very important. Very important. Got ahead of my notes. So first, let's look at Jesus' baptism, his water baptism. And this is going to be our main scripture for today. We're going to be here for a little bit. So Matthew 3, don't forget about John 3 now, but Matthew 3, verse 13. Matthew 3, starting at verse 13. Most people read over this and they think, ooh, Rod, Jesus got baptized. This is a profound scripture that we need to dissect and understand to the ultimate degree, if you will. <clears throat> Starting at, uh, at verse 13, then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him, to be baptized by John. This is God in the flesh going to be baptized. Why does God in the flesh need to be baptized? Well, I'm glad you asked. We're going to get into that. 
And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? But Jesus answered him and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Very important scripture there. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Remember Jesus says, I did not come to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law. Same thing. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately out from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my son, beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. In whom I am well pleased. Now, a lot of people would just read that scripture and go, Oorah, Jesus, you got baptized and God loves you. Well, we need to go a little bit deeper than that. And this is, this is the scriptures that we're going to look at today. <clears throat> As Christ was immersed or baptized, the first baptism that we recognize in the water, verse 16 says, Jesus came up immediately from the water. Jesus came up immediately from the water. As I explained many times throughout in the teachings of scriptures, Jesus always uses something physical that we would understand and that we can understand to teach something spiritual. So this is what he is doing with, the, with this teaching today. He is saying that this immersion is a depiction or a symbolism of his burial and resurrection of his burial and resurrection. He immersed, he went under the same way as being enclosed into the grave. And then he came out of the grave. We know that over in the, in the gospels where Jesus was resurrected. The grave was empty. That's what we celebrate on Easter. Our risen Lord. He did die at the physical man, Jesus. He died and he went to the grave and he quit breathing and his heart quit beating, but only for in a moment. And then on the third day, he, raised, he was raised again to life. A dead person was raised to life. And this is the depiction of the water baptism. It is his burial, the immersion, the going under. And then him coming up immediately means exactly that. That immediately he was alive again. And that's exactly what happened we don't know what happened the first day to the third day, but if you read through scriptures, you can pretty much ascertain that uh, he immediately was alive and went to hell and ministered. Uh, in Peter, it tells us that he even ministered to those who, uh, who uh, were in, the, in Sheol, in hell. Not in the eternal lake of fire, but in Sheol or hell, okay? Which, if you remember the uh, Lazarus and the rich, man, rich king, the rich king was on one side of uh, Hades or Sheol and, uh, or hell, and then Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom on the other side. And there was a chasm between them, and one couldn't go from the other, etc. And then when Jesus went to hell, he took the saints, Ephesians 2, he took the saints with him and led a train into heaven. So Jesus went and ministered to those souls who, are, who were of God's people who were in Hades, who had died and were in Hades. The um, uh, Catholic religion, if you will, not trying to pick on them, they call that purgatory. It's a holding place. It's a holding place. There are no longer any of the saints left in Sheol or in Hades. Why? Because Christ took them to heaven when he ascended into heaven. But the depiction of Jesus being baptized in the water or being immersed in the water and immediately coming up is his death, his burial, and his resurrection. His resurrection to what? His resurrection into his new life. Jesus did not perform any ministry acts whatsoever, any signs, any wonders, any miracles until after he was baptized. He said, I must be baptized to fulfill righteousness. What is the righteousness? The righteousness is to take all of your sins and all of my sins and all of the sins of the world upon his innocent self. 
he imputes to us or gives to us his righteousness as yet while we are still sinners. So he, his righteousness becomes our righteousness. See, we don't have any righteousness. But his righteousness becomes ours because he was the sinless lamb of God with no sin whatsoever, the innocent lamb, and he was taken and he took his own life he says, I take it and I lay it down and I'll take it up again. I choose to do that. He chose to do this for you and me. He says, I lay it down for you. I take your sins upon myself and then I choose to raise myself up again. So it is his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And to fulfill righteousness, he took the innocent lamb of God, took all of our sins upon himself voluntarily. Voluntarily. That is the only way you and I can have righteousness. When he came up out of the water, he, came, he became that new person, that new creation that you and I become. He is always God. He is always was God, and he always will be God. But if you remember over in Philippians 2 and 10, he says he took none of his deity upon himself for his own benefit. In other words, he didn't do anything for himself at any point in time to show that, oh, well, I need a miracle to save me. He didn't need any miracles. He is the miracle. He is the miracle. So he didn't need to do any signs and wonders and miracles to save himself because he knew. And he even said, I choose to lay down my life and I choose to take it up again. So he already knew who he was. But he had to show us who he was. And so whenever he went under the water, he rose again. He became that new example for us to follow, which is the full righteousness of God living in a man. The full righteousness of God living in a man. A new life that involved the purpose of him being sent to us. That's why he came. To show us that we as human beings could live a better life. Now, we're still working on ourselves, right? At least I am. I don't know about y'all. Y'all probably never sin again in your whole life. But uh, this old boy does. And so I need work. And the only way that I can get work is by the power of the Holy Spirit living in me. A new life that involved the purpose of him being sent to us. He would, he would not fulfill his purpose without, without being fully God or having God fully in him, which is the Holy Spirit. There's no way that Jesus, the man, okay, remember, Jesus was a man. We look at him as, as, as Savior, Lord, etc., and he is. But at this particular time, he walked the earth just as a man. In, taking none of his deity for his own, his own favor. So we look at him and we think, oh, well, no, he was Jesus, so he could do anything that he wanted to. He could, but he didn't. He didn't use any of that for his own favor. So we must look at him at this point. We must look at him as a mere man. And that mere man died. He died, and then he went, as his baptism is, depicts, he went under the water, or he was buried, and when he immediately came up, he was immediately resurrected, that man was, into the new creature that he could show us, which is his deity. There, from that point on, he could do all the signs and wonders and miracles that he needed to do to show us that he was fully God and to complete his, his ministry as being the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Prior to that, he depicted himself just as a man. He is showing us again by his example, by his example, that we could not fulfill our purpose without being born again. We cannot. Why? Because you do not have the Holy Spirit working in you. Jesus says, without me. Now, remember, there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is much God is God the Father, and God the Father is much Holy Spirit is, is God the Son, and God the Son is much Holy Spirit, or as much God is Holy, the Holy Spirit. I hope you got that, because I didn't. 
But the three, the triune God is all one God, though three different deities and three different purposes. And the per, Jesus said himself, you cannot do anything. He said, you can't do anything for the kingdom of God. You cannot do anything without me. So we must have God in the form of the Holy Spirit in order to do what God has called us to do in this life. And that is your purpose for being here. It's the same purpose as the purpose that Jesus came. The same purpose. You have the same job, the same calling that Jesus has. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. What is that purpose? Jesus came to the earth so that the earth could know God. You are here so that the world can know God through you. Same purpose, same reason. You ever think of it that way? Oh, no, I'm just here to worship and praise and pay my tithes and hope Jesus will love me. Jesus loves you already. He loves you in spite of you. As yet, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much love do you need to be loved? I mean, gee, Jesus, Wow. This bat- baptism is also uh, noted over in, in Mark 1, and you can, I think you wrote this down last week, so you don't need to write this. But in Mark 1, 9, 11, Luke 3, 21, 22, and John 1, 29, 34. But the best depiction is here, the one we're studying today here in Matthew. This is the best depiction of Christ's baptism and why he was baptized. Let's look back up at uh, verse 15. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus had to perform the baptism this way. He had not yet, whenever he was immersed, he had not yet received the Holy Spirit. Now you say, wait a minute. Jesus is God. So he has the Holy Spirit. Then you have to go back to where I talked about in Philippians 2. You have to understand That Jesus had none of his deity, used none of his deity, uh, used any of his, I said that, used any of his deity for his own favor, for his own benefit. So, though he is equal to the Holy Spirit, as that man Jesus, just as you and I are people, without the Holy Spirit, he was immersed or, or depicted his burial, death, burial, and resurrection. And when he came up out of the water, guess what happened? All of heaven opens up. We can read this. Look at uh, verse 16 again. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately out of the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on, upon him. Here's your, your triune God right here. He saw the Spirit of God, the Father, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus himself. The triune God is right there at one time. And they all come together. And the Holy Spirit came and lit upon Christ in the form of a dove. Now, why did the Holy Spirit... Okay, so when we're baptized, how come we don't get a dove to light on our shoulders? Well, you probably don't want to try that. Because birds seem to have a, another thing in mind whenever they light, okay? So... It is a depiction, a physical depiction of the Spirit of God coming and being upon Christ. It is a physical thing that we can understand teaching a spiritual lesson. And it's the same thing with us. We don't see a dove come. We don't see heaven open up. Oh, would he got baptized today. All of heaven just just exuberant with... uh, with joy and, and, uh, and honor and all that kind of, no, no, no. In my opinion, God's probably up there going, well, it's about time. And it was about time. But no dove came and lit down on me so that everybody could see that I was baptized. No. But the Holy Spirit came and lit inside of me at that very moment that I accepted Christ. Now, I didn't say the very moment that I was baptized in water. I said the very moment that I accepted Christ. Okay? 
verse 17 and suddenly a voice from heaven came from the a voice came from heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom in whom I am well pleased. Jesus had not done any miracle for performances or signs and wonders or anything at this time. He simply got baptized. He simply was baptized. And then God said, this, with him I am well pleased. In him I am well pleased. Which simply is stating the fact that the Holy Spirit came down and entered into Jesus entered into Jesus, the man Jesus. And therefore, Jesus was at this time able to do all the signs and wonders, all the miracles that God had appointed him to do before the beginning of time. You cannot do anything without the Holy Spirit for the benefit of the kingdom. Nothing. So you have to have the Holy Spirit. It is very important that we understand those first three baptisms, the baptism of water, baptism of fire, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> this was Jesus' first public demonstration of his lordship or his messiahship as a testimony to his deity. Can you imagine whenever that heaven opened up in the form of a dove? I mean, it... You would think, oh, well, it's just a dove lighting down. There had to be some thunder roars and, and lightning flashing and all that kind of stuff in my mind in order to, uh, I mean, what an honor. What an honor. And the world saw this. The world saw this at the time. Showing us three things. This is a testimony to his, de his deity showing us three things that our faith is based on. The first thing is his death, burial, and resurrection into a new life. His death, burial, and resurrection into a new life. If you do not believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, then you do not have faith in Christ. You better, oh, pardon me, you better believe in it because your eternal life depends on it. Because if you just die and are buried and don't believe in the resurrection, then guess what? You're going to stay buried. And eventually you will be buried. You will be buried in hell. That's where your spirit will be held in Sheol, in hell, in Hades. And then eventually your spirit will be interned into the eternal lake of fire forever. We must. Our faith is based on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's what Easter is all about. It's certainly not about bunny rabbits and chocolate eggs or whatever. It is about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You see, most of the time whenever people say, oh yeah, the gospel is Jesus died for my sins. No, he didn't. He rose so that you'll have eternal life. Wouldn't you think that's a little bit more important? Oh, Jesus died for my sins. Okay, so he died, so is he still in the grave? Well, certainly not. He rose again, and we must profess that. We must believe that. We must share that. Because if you don't believe in the resurrection, how are you going to be raised again? You won't be. Because you don't believe in the resurrection. So first was his death, burial, and resurrection into a new life. The second was the baptism is a significant act of our faith. A significant act of our faith. Jesus said on the night before he was uh, to go and to be crucified over in uh, 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, he says, uh, Paul is speaking of it, he says, uh, and Jesus speaks about it through the Gospels, he says, this is my body given for you, my death, burial, and resurrection. It's given for you. That's why we take, partake of the elements. The elements, the, the wafer or the bread or whatever you want to call it, is, is depicting his body given for us. Death, burial, and resurrection. His blood washes away our sin. That's the wine. That's the reason that we celebrate what we call the Lord's Supper or communion, whatever you want to call it. But our faith is based on the death, burial, and resurrection, the baptism of Jesus Christ, and that Jesus is the only Savior for sinners. No one else had, the dove, had heaven open up and the dove come and light on him in the form of the Holy Spirit. 
Only Christ did. And nowhere else does it say in Scripture, when someone was baptized, does a voice from heaven say, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus is the only Savior. There's not another, and we must accept that. A lot of people don't. There's plenty of ways to get to heaven. No, there's not. John 14, 6 tells us that Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me except, to the Father except through me. This is what our faith is based on. This is why this, this small one, two, three, four, five scriptures are so important that we truly understand. It's not just the fact that Jesus got baptized. It's that Jesus is showing us the way to heaven. And it is through him and him alone. So we're going to look at 16 a little bit deeper. He came up immediately, which means that there was an instantaneous change. Get this, an instantaneous change. He came up immediately, there was a change in him. And that takes place in us when we are born again. And when this happens, when this happened with him, heaven opened up and all of heaven rejoiced. And the Holy Spirit came into him. Let's go to Acts 1. Acts 1, verse 8. We're going to be in Acts for a minute. Acts 1, verse 8. Acts 1 verse 8, Jesus is saying, but you shall receive power when, the, when, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So when you receive the Holy Spirit, you will have power. Power. Oh, does that mean that? I can go out here. You know, I think I have power when I go to the grocery store because I walk up to the front door and I say, open. <laughs> and the doors just open up. I mean, that's pretty powerful, isn't it? I don't touch it or anything. I don't have to pull it. I don't have to unlock it. I just walk up and say, open. And they just, Phew. it's like parting, parting of the Red Sea, right? I haven't tried that yet. I don't think it'll work. But, we receive power, not that kind of power. I'm just kidding, of course. The power that we receive is the power to go out and share the gospel with the world and save the world. Now, we don't save, all right? But in our teaching, preaching, sharing of the word, sharing of the gospel, sharing of what Christ has done for us, you can raise the dead, the spiritual dead, into the spiritual alive. You have power to raise the dead. Matter of fact, the book of Romans tells us that we, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. That's a lot of power. Jesus chose to raise himself from the dead, did he not? That's what he said over in the book of John. He says, I choose to lay down my life and I choose to take it up again. You have the same power. What? You ever think of that? Has anybody ever thought of that? You have that same power. You have the power to resurrect a dead soul into a living spirit. Now, you don't save, okay? Uh, please understand that. You never save. But by sharing, Mike, I'm going to share. The Holy Spirit's telling me this, so I'm going to share it. All right? I hope it's okay with you. If it's not, you can shoot me later. Yesterday, he and I were talking. You know, his mom passed away. My mom passed away recently, and it broke my heart. Well, it broke his heart, and sure, we understand that. But my message is always, when I do funerals, is that if this person is a believer, we shall see this person again, because they're guaranteed eternal life. So Mike got the message yesterday, if you will, not that he hadn't had it before. He got the message, though, that if he wants to see his mom again, he has to be saved. Not that he's not saved, okay? I'm not saying that. But it's, I think it's sunk in a little bit deeper, if you will. And he understood that if I want to see my mom again, I must be saved. Well, the only way to be saved is to be born again. 
I want to see my mom again. My mom was saved. I want to see her again. To see her again, I must be saved. To be saved, I must be born again. Now, again, I'm not trying to say he, didn't, he wasn't already saved. I believe he is. But the fact is, when we get a little bit deeper in the understandings of Scripture, it resonates better with us. We grasp it better. We understand it more. And that's the whole purpose of, of understanding these simple verses here, these five verses here, is that it's not just about Jesus being baptized. It's the example of us being baptized, being regenerated, being born again, and having a way to heaven, which is through the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. When this, ha when this happened with Jesus, all of heaven broke up, uh, woke, opened up, and the Holy Spirit came upon him. In Acts 1 and 8, which I just read to you, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and, the, and he says, you shall receive the power with the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Just go to uh, verse 2, I mean chapter 2, verse 1. We're going to talk a little bit about this. Chapter 2, verse 1. The day of Pentecost. I know you're all interested in that day. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, this was 50 days after the death and burial and resurrection of Christ. When uh, Pentecost means 50. And uh, they were all on one accord in one place and suddenly a, there came a sound from the heaven, a sound from the heaven, just like the Holy Spirit coming upon them, right? Just like the Holy Spirit coming upon Christ. They heard God's voice. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were seating. Then there appeared to them divine tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. This is the baptism of fire, the purification of that person's spirit. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Don't stop there. Okay? You must read on. And there were dwellings, and there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. Of every nation under heaven. And when the sound, this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galatians? Are not all these Galileans? Are not all these from the same group of people? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Now, many people take the day of Pentecost... And I'm not trying to dispute anything. You believe what you want to believe. They take the day, the day of Pentecost and they stop up there at verse uh, 4. Yeah, verse 4. And they say, and the Spirit gave them utterance. Which means they spoke in an unknown language. You can't stop there. You have to continue reading. There is no break uh, I hope all of you know, and I think all of you do, is that in the original writings, there is no chapter, there is no verses, etc. This is one letter, one letter. The book of Acts is a letter written to, it's called the Acts of the Apostles, actually. And it is one letter written to uh, the Jews in any who, any who would believe. So you can't stop at verse 4. You have to read on, and I have... Let's go down to verse 8 where we left off. And how is it that we hear each our own language in which we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judah, and Cap Cappadocia, however you say it, Pontus and Asia, Pergama, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, 
visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. They're not speaking in unknown language. They're speaking in the known language of these different nations. So, and again, I'm not trying to argue the point. You believe what you want to believe. But the word says they spoke in known languages. And people were witnesses to this. He says, you're speaking in our language, the works of God. It would be like, and I wish I could, but I can't. I wish I could speak Spanish. Then I could understand Arturo. According to Raul, Raul interprets for us somewhat. And Raul says he preaches a great message. But I don't have a clue because I don't speak Spanish. If I could speak Spanish, I would be enlightened by his ministry. Even more so. I'm already enlightened because I can just see it. I feel the Holy Spirit working on him. But I don't know what he's saying. I wish I did, but I don't. So I rely on Raul to interpret for me what he is saying. Raul speaks Spanish fluently. So he understands everything he is saying. That's exactly what happened here at Pentecost. People spoke in known languages, and other people said, how do they know my language? They're all Galileans. They're all from Texas. How in the world did they speak uh, Hispanic, uh, Spanish? Well, I mean, a lot of people in Texas. You understand what I'm saying, right? Okay? Just because you're Texas, from Texas doesn't mean you speak Spanish. It just means that a lot of people here do, of course. It'd be like, me going to Oklahoma, I wouldn't understand a word they say. <laughs> exactly, Arkansas. Just like y'all going to Georgia, y'all wouldn't understand the cotton picking thing, I'd say. Well, maybe you would. My point is simply this, is that, in, and this is always so taken out of context, the scripture. It simply says they spoke in known languages and people understood the works, words of God. That's what it says. Two, twenty-nine. Two and twenty-nine. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he was both dead and buried in his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, the fruit of David's body, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit at his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not to be left in Hades. Now, this is a promise to you too. Would not be left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we have all witness, therefore being exalted to the right hand of the Father and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which we, you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into, heaven, into the heavens, but he, himself, he says himself, the Lord is said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make you enemies uh, make your enemies your footstool. I love this part where it says, the Lord said to my Lord, God said to Jesus, is what that is depicting. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when you have heard this, they're all cut to, when they heard this, they're all cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the, and the, rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? We crucified him. What shall we do? Glad you asked. Then Peter said to them, repent and let everyone who of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for this is the promise to you and to your children and to all who are afar off as many as the Lord our God will call as many as the Lord our God will call read on down 40 
And with many other words, they testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from, the, uh, from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received this word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. 3,000 souls. Why? Because they were baptized. Were they baptized for their sins? No. They weren't baptized for the sin. Nowhere in here does it say that there was water up there or a tub or a tank or, or any type of water whatsoever. They were baptized in their spirit. They were baptized in their spirit being. You see, that's where the true baptism is. The baptism is in our spirit, not in the water. It is receiving the Holy Spirit and letting his power purify you, cleanse you, rid you, your spirit, of all sin. Of all sin. The water cleans the outside. We talked about this last week. The Holy Spirit cleanses the inside, the true you. You still have a soul and a body to deal with. But your spirit is made perfect. As perfect as Christ is perfect. No water is, is in here, indicated in here whatsoever at any time. It is the baptism of the Spirit. In John 2 and 22, Jesus blew on his disciples. Don't go there. But Jesus blew on his disciples and said, Receive the Spirit. Now, a lot of you may re remember that scripture, and that happened before the day of Pentecost. But what he is saying there, he is saying that this is a, uh, a pledge my pledge to you that at some point you will receive the Holy Spirit. At some point you will receive the Holy Spirit. If we go back over into uh, Acts 1, 8, it says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So over in John, whenever he says, he blew upon them and he says they received the Holy Spirit, it's that he, they received the pledge of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't until the day of Pentecost that they actually received the Holy Spirit. Not by water baptism, by spirit baptism. They were born again. In, let's go to Acts 4. I, I'm sorry, Acts 1, 4. Acts 1, 4. I'm going to show you this one more time. And being assembled together with them, this is his disciples and Jesus, right before his ascension. He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So in other words, they had not yet received the Holy Spirit. Over in John 20 and 22, it says that he blew upon them and they received the Spirit. They received the pledge or the promise of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit did not come upon them until they were baptized in the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Therefore, when you have come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times and seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. In other words, you don't know when you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. You don't know when you're going to be baptized. You don't know when you're going to change. You don't know when your day of salvation is going to come. But God does. God knew when I was nine years old, and I can only use me because... Billy won't let me talk about him. And Johnny won't let me talk about him. So I can talk about Russ, but you don't want to hear about that. No, I'm just kidding. At nine years old, God knew that I was going to submit to him. And I was going to be baptized at nine years old. And I truly meant what I said. I, I meant it totally, 100%. I knew what I was doing. He also knew that I was going to backslide pretty quick. And I did. And I did for many, 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 many years. But I look at that as a training period, a teaching period, a learning period. After all, all the stuff that I went through in my life, 
made me who I am today. I know some of y'all might not like that, but it is what it is. But the same thing happened to you. And then one day, one day, God urged you enough to where you said, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. And you received the Holy Spirit. See, you may have said, hey, I believe Jesus. Hey, I go to church. Hey, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And if you, you, we make all these promises, and then we kind of say, oh, well, I don't really want to go to church today. Oh, well, I could really do this or I could do that. Oh, I'm just too tired. Hey, the cowboys are fixing to come on. I can't go to church. And then God's going to get a hold of you. And when God changes you, you will know you've been changed. When he truly changes you, when you truly surrender, when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you, he will truly, truly change you. There has to be a new person, a new person, and that's being born again. If there's no change in your life, yes, I was baptized in the water, but there's no change in your life, you're not baptized in the Spirit. One simple way, simple, very, very simple way of realizing if you're baptized in the Spirit. We use this quite often, or I do. Some things that I used to do, I thought were just fine. I ain't hurting nobody. I'm having a good time. I enjoy myself. No big deal. No big deal at all. And then the Holy Spirit gets a hold of me. I'm going to use it. I've used it before, and you've all heard this, but I'm going to use it one more time. In arguing with God, going to Bible study one night, I told God, I don't want to quit smoking. He says, you need to quit smoking. I said, I don't want to. I like to smoke. Smoker understands this. Non-smokers go, oh, are you kidding? I liked to smoke. I'd done it so long. It was a habit, and I just it's just what I did. And then God says, I don't want you to do it for you. I want you to do it for me. Now, I did not make a deal with God, but I told God, fine, I am weak, you're strong. And I need you to take it away if you want me to quit. Because I can't do it, and I don't want to do it. That night, God took it away, and I haven't smoked since that night. That was six, seven years ago, whatever it was. Now, I only use that as an example, not to try to boast or anything, but the example is, is that the Holy Spirit can do with you whatever God wants to do with you if you will allow it. If you will allow it, but you have to allow it. You can withhold God from your life if you want to, but God is there for you if you will allow it. Jesus tells us over in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, he says, I stand at the door and knock. If you will open the door, I will come in and dine with you. In other words, live with you. You must be born again. There must be a change in you. You must have a new creation come up out of that water. The spiritual water, not the water in the tank. If there is no change, you might reconsider where you're at with Christ. Because there must be a change in you. You must be a different person. I am way off my notes, so I have no idea where I'm supposed to be. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh, I know where I want to go. Luke 15. Let's go over to Luke 15 real quick. Well, don't, you, you don't have to go there. I'm just going to give this to you. Luke 15, chapter, uh, verse 7 and 10. Okay, I've got 7 and 10 written down. What happens whenever you're reborn? What happens when you're reborn? All of heaven... Boy, I have really messed up. All of heaven rejoices... Rejoices, all of heaven rejoices at the repentance of one sinner. One sinner. When in chapter, uh, verse 17 of Matthew 3, where we saw heaven opened up and the dove came down and lit on, upon Jesus, and a voice spoke from heaven and says, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Heaven does the exact same thing when you are saved, when you're truly, truly saved. Heaven rejoices at one sinner coming home. 
rejoices at one person being saved. There are thousands upon thousands of angels in heaven that are rejoicing every day because another sinner came home, another sinner came home, another sinner came home. People wonder sometimes, oh, whenever we die, we're going to be angels. No, you're not. There are thousands upon thousands upon 10,000 upon 10,000 upon millions and millions and millions of angels. Nobody knows how many, but there's a bunch. And you will not be an angel. I don't care what your mom said. You're not going to be an angel. To her, you're an angel. But you are not going to be an angel in heaven. You are going to be you in heaven. You're going to be you in heaven. And you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. And you're going to be able to work for the Lord. The same as what you're called to do here. The exact same thing. All of heaven rejoices. In verse 10, it says, Likewise, I say to you, there will be joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. That's Luke 15, 10. But repentance doesn't mean repentance from a certain sin. Oh, you mean heaven rejoices whenever I uh, quit drinking, or when I quit smoking, when I quit doing drugs, when I quit stealing, when I quit carousing, when I, when I quit lying, when I quit cussing. Heaven's going to rejoice over that. No, that's not it at all. Heaven is going to rejoice when you are born again and you become a believer in Jesus Christ. That's when heaven rejoices. Because everything else comes after that. Unless you are that new creation, you're not going to change. Oh, well, you know, I think I want to quit smoking. You can't think you want to quit smoking. You have to want to quit smoking. If you just think it, you're not going to quit. It's that simple. You have to, oh, I think I'll just quit lying then because God doesn't like lying. Oh, it's one of the Ten Commandments, actually. You're not going to quit lying. Unless you're born again, you won't quit. You won't change. I'm not trying to be discouraging. I'm simply telling you, Jesus says you cannot do anything without him. So why are you fighting these, whatever they happens to be, these sins in your life, if you're not going to submit to Christ and let him change you from the inside to quit this stuff, whatever it is? And I'm not throwing stones, man. I got enough sins in my life. If I was just worried about my own life, I'd have a full-time job, which I do. I got enough to work on. You got to worry about your job or your, your life. But if there's something in your life that is, you don't think or God is putting on your heart that it, he is not pleased with, only the Holy Spirit is going to change it. You're not going to change. You cannot change without the Holy Spirit. Oh, well, I think I can. Don't think you can. No, you can. Jesus says you can do it with him because he will do it. So many times we try to do things on our own. Yet while we are weak, he is strong. Amen. Remember I explained several months ago that after about 10 years here at the church, of simple, what I call simple studying, not trying to demean it in any way, that it was time to go a little bit deeper into the Word of God. Some may feel, well, you know, there's just too much flipping through the Bible. There's just, you know, I would rather be preached to. Well, you know, that's fine. That's fine. But remember, there's 66 books in the Bible. 66 books. And if you simply listen to me, then you're trusting me to give you, which I would not in any way, shape, form, or fashion give you any inaccurate information because I try to teach. I, I, I go just to the Word. I don't go to anything else to learn, you know, what God wants me to share with you. But you're trusting in me, and I don't want you to trust in me. I don't want you to trust in me. I, as I stand before God today, I would not mislead you in, on purpose in any way, shape, form, or fashion. I want you to trust Jesus. I want you to trust in him. I want you to trust in the Holy Spirit. And the only way to do that is to learn the word of God. That's the only way to do it. You have to learn the word of God. You have to get God's message. <clears throat> and if you don't open your scriptures and study your scriptures and get into the depths of your scriptures, then you're only getting the surface stuff. 
And you can go so much farther with the depth that you can achieve. Or as Paul says, the meat of Scripture. The meat is what is nourishing. The milk will sustain you, but the meat will nourish you. The meat will help you grow. That is in Scripture. Paul talks about it many times. So we have to get to the meat of the Scriptures. And the only way to do that is to get into the scriptures, into the depth of the scriptures. That's the reason of taking these five little verses in the book of Matthew and talking about the baptism of Jesus. There's so much more there than just saying, wow, Jesus got baptized. Yeah, he did. In order to fulfill the righteousness of God. That righteousness was him being obedient to take your sins and my sins upon himself to die for your sins and my sins, to pay that atoning sacrifice for your sins and my sins, and then to rise again to life again, telling us, as it tells us over in John 14, 19, I shall live, so shall you live. Because I live, so shall you live, is what he says. But that's only if you're born again. It's only if you're born again. Jesus says in 3 and 7, John 3 and 7, you, let's all say this together, because we, we need to hear this, we need to understand this. Let's all say it together. You must be born again. Not baptized. You are born again in the Spirit, and then you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. You're baptized in fire. You're baptized in water in, in order to show your public proclamation to everybody else that what has already happened and occurred inside you. You, once you are born in the Spirit, reborn, born again, you are a new creation, Paul tells us. Something that never existed before. Why? Because the Holy Spirit, just as God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God says the exact same thing about you. This is Carolyn, my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. This is Johnny, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. This is Kathy, my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. God is pleased to live in you. Not with you, in you. But without him, you will not please God. It's that simple. It's that simple. Jesus says you must be born again. You think, oh, well, man, we've covered that. Well, I got news for you. We're going to go deeper into John 3. Okay? And we're going to understand what Jesus is talking about even more. About being born again. Because you have to be. You're not going to heaven, friend. You're not going to go to heaven, Jesus says, unless you are born again. Wow. That can be pretty deep. So we're going to look at that in a couple of weeks, all right? God bless you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for each and every day. Lord, I especially thank you for Allowing me, a sinner of sinners, to be born again. I look back at my life and I think of all the wasted time and the wasted years. And and I don't have regret, Lord, because you allowed me to go through these things, I think, so that I would have a better appreciation for you. And I do. I know that yet while I was still a sinner, you died for me. And I pray that everyone here today realizes that. There's nothing in this world that can separate your love from us. And the perfect example of your love for us was that John 3 and 16, where God, you sent your one and only begotten son to this earth that who shall ever believeth in you shall not perish but receive eternal life. I pray that so today, Lord, over anyone and everyone who hears this teaching today, that they will surrender to you and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. If that's you today and you want to receive him, you must mean it in your heart because God knows your heart. But you can simply say in meaning, 
Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. From this day forward, I ask that you live with me, guide and direct my life for your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you've said that prayer, then the word says that Jesus will come in as the Holy Spirit and live in you. All of heaven will rejoice. You are now reborn and the Holy Spirit is pleased. God is pleased to live in you. If you've done that today, please let me know so that I can celebrate your new birth.